Welcome back. Today we're going to talk about the second part of um, a, a three-part plan series on cache. The topic today is average memory access time and the three C's of cache miss. We're also going to talk a little bit about the um, initial understanding of the impact of cache on computer performance. Um, and we'll talk about methods for reducing um, the impact of negative factors on performance. So remember from last time that the ideal situation for storage in a computer system is that you have a really large, um, we would like to conceptually think of it as infinite storage uh, component for the processor to use that is fast enough to keep up with the processor and um, cheap enough that it doesn't dominate the cost of the computer system. We use uh, hierarchical caching to give the illusion of this idealized large and fast memory. So um, large storage units are slow and cheap small storage units are fast and expensive. So we use the fast, expensive, and small storage units closer to the processor. And as we get farther and farther away from the processing logic, we can use larger but less, um, I guess, quick <laughs> uh, cache units so the hierarchy works because programs exhibit locality. They exhibit both spatial and temporal locality. So spatial locality is the idea that if you access something, you will access something nearby it in some kind of um, spatial dimension. And then temporal locality is a similar concept, but in the dimension of time. So if you access something you're going to access it again um, nearby in time, so soon. And this follows from the empirical observation that programs tend to exhibit high locality, that 90% of a program is spent in 10% of the code. Um, so locality helps us to improve performance by taking advantage of caching and by keeping uh, data and instructions close by to the processor that have been used before or that are close by to elements that have been used recently. And then modern processors furthermore are exploiting chip level parallelism with multiple processing cores and so there's actually distributed cache usually at the L1 and L2 levels with private often private L1 caches for each core to use and then possibly shared L2 caches uh, and, and then typically a shared L3 cache or no L3 cache before going out to memory and as we see at each of these levels we can get more cache but it takes us longer to access them so a typical l1 cache hit is approximately four processor cycles in modern technology uh, typical l2 cache hit is around 10 processor cycles now these numbers do vary depending on the processor design and the cache design um, but those are general architectural targets for high performance processors. The L3 cache, when it exists, is usually around 40 processor cycles. And then main memory, um, this one is widely varying. It really does depend heavily on the cycle time. Um, it, it's really about a, a hundred, um, 100 to 200 nanoseconds or so, and this comes out to something close to 300 cycles in modern processor technology. So um, 
in the 1.5 to 3 gigahertz range, right? A 3 gigahertz processor, 100 nanoseconds is 300 cycles. And then to access the storage um, hard disk is on the order of hundreds of thousands to millions of processor cycles to move data back and forth between storage and memory. So when we talk about hits, we have read hits and read hits in the instruction cache and data cache. So the dollar sign is often used as a mnemonic for cache, cache money. Read hits are what we want, that's great. So we don't have to worry about what happens when we have a read hit um, right now. When there's a write hit, we have some choices that we can make. Uh, so the write hit means that we're writing to a cache line and the tag matched at the index. And so what we can do next is we can write through the block that we're updating to lower levels of the hierarchy. So if we have a hit at some level of the hierarchy in a write through cache, we can write that value to the next level of cache on down to the last level of cache and then to the memory, um, maybe even out to disk. And we'll talk about the notion of, um, well, we'll talk about how disk storage plays a role in uh, the discussion on virtual memory, which will be after this series probably. So the write through cache is always going to write data into the next level of the hierarchy. And it would stall the processor until the write is finished at all levels. But with, with some hardware, um, with a hardware write buffer or a store buffer, it's sometimes called, you can put the value into this buffer and then say, okay, I've done my job. I've, I've written the value to the next level of hierarchy. So I am done with this write. Uh, you conceptually think of it as once you put the value into the write buffer, then you've kind of offloaded responsibility for finishing the write to the next level of the hierarchy. The other policy is a write back policy. So the write back policy only writes the value to the cache row where you get a hit. And so it doesn't necessarily write to the next level of the cache and it doesn't write to memory until later. And so the value in main memory and the value in lower levels of cache, if there are any, for a given cache tag will be stale. They'll be um, they, they won't be consistent with the value that's inside of the cache where you got the hit. And what we, what we call this cache line that had the hit and that's inconsistent is we call it dirty. It's been modified. So sometimes we'll call it modified. Um, historically with write back caches, we call them dirty. When we talk about multiprocessor caches, we're going to talk about modified. Um, which is the same idea. So the cache line is dirty because it's been changed and it's not consistent with the cache lines that are further down in the memory hierarchy. In a uniprocessor, single processing um, computer, this is uh, not, a, not a hard problem to solve because the processor is always typically always going through the cache to get to the data that it wants. So if it finds a hit anywhere on its route down to memory, it knows that that's good data for it to use. When the cache row that's dirty has to be replaced, so um, it, there's, a <clears throat> there's a miss that fetches a new line into the cache for the same index and the dirty line gets replaced. Then at that point, that dirty line has to be written back to the next level of cache. That could cause the next level of cache to update with this dirty row. 
uh, it could write back all the way to memory in some cases. And again, you can use a, a write buffer or a store buffer to sort of um, to offload the responsibility for those writes so that you don't really have to wait around for them. So now let's talk about what happens if you have a single word block size and you have cache misses. So on a read miss, you have to stall the processor. There's no, really no, um, no other way around it, at, at least at this point in time. You have to wait until the either instruction or the data that you are requesting gets into the cache because that information is required by the processor for it to continue. The processor is asking for this instruction or this word of data, and it's going to need it in the future um, and really soon, if not immediately. And so we stall the pipeline on a read miss and then fetch the block into the L1 cache. This may end up fetching it from the L2 cache if we're lucky, then the miss will be not too steep of a penalty, right? 10 cycle uh, to stall for the L2 miss, L2 hit rather. Anyway, it, it may have to go all the way out to memory. That could be a pretty large penalty, right? Um, 320, 340, maybe 350 cycles. Uh, if you, we'll see in a moment, but we add up the penalties along the way, right? So when we bring the block into the cache, we might have to evict a dirty block if one exists. With a store buffer, we won't have to wait for that eviction to complete. Uh, and we can actually start that eviction we, we could start that eviction before we actually fetch the block. And then we send the word that the processor wants um, back to the processor from the cache. And the processor can pick and choose within that word if it wants bytes of that word. The cache controller, which accesses the cache, is able to do that pretty, pretty simply. Once the word is in the processor, then the processor can resume. So a cache miss a read miss causes a pipeline stall, which means it's going to reduce CPI. It's going to impact CPI for load words and um, for any instruction that has a fetch miss, right? So fetch misses cause stalls and then uh, data, data reads of memory. And then write misses only affect the data cache because we don't consider writing to the instruction cache typically. So on a write miss, uh, we will stall the pipeline again. This can be, well, we'll talk about that in a little later. Stall the pipeline, fetch the block into the cache again. We need the block in the cache and we can write the word from the processor to the cache and then resume the pipeline. Now with one word blocks, there's some interesting sort of um, maybe optimization or, or choices we can make. We have the choice to do what's called write allocate, which is that we, uh, in, in, the, in the one word cache, we just write the word into the cache and update the tag. And we don't have to check for a cache hit. We don't need to stall. And that's because we know that this is a write through cache. I think I said that. So for the write through cache, we know it's a write through cache and there's only one word blocks. So we can just replace whatever word is there with the current word being written. And then we can um, write that into the store buffer to go down to the next level of hierarchy. And the reason this is safe to do is because in the write through cache, whatever line we overwrite there exists in lower levels of the cache. So it's, um, it, it's safe to do that from a consistency point of view. And then there's no write allocate. So um, allocate in this, in this uh, scenario means allocating 
the block of the cache or the, the line of the cache for this data. Okay. So if we don't allocate on a write, what we end up doing is we invalidate the block in the um, row of the cache. We don't check for a hit again. We just invalidate it and we put the value in the store buffer. The reason for using these policies is to increase the write speed at the L1 cache so that we don't have to stall for the L1 cache writes. Um, and these work best in a write through cache. Um, write back caches, you still have to check for a dirty block, so you still have to do some checking anyway. So this is why you'll often find a write through cache at the L1 level. So in, uh, in multi-word blocks, which is a much more common scenario, for read misses, uh, instruction and data cache, the read misses are dealt with the same way as in a single word block. You stall the pipeline, you fetch the block, you do the read, you send the requested word back. However, there is a common optimization that you can perform on a multi-word block, which is to um, request from memory the word that the processor wants first. So um, if this is the last level cache, especially, then you can specify, okay, I want this specific byte from memory rather than fetching the whole cache block, I'm gonna fetch this word and then I'll fill in the rest of the words. And we'll look at an example of why that matters later, I think. And then early restart is another common optimization, which is that you can resume the processor as soon as the requested word is available. So the cache continues to fill in the other words. In combination, early restart with requested word first can reduce the impact of the read misses because you get the requested word into the cache first and you return it to the processor first and you resume the processor while the other words are still filling. Um, you can use these uh, optimizations without the other, but most often they're combined. And sometimes you'll see the requested word first called the critical word first. Uh, it's just synonymous. And then write misses. On a write miss, if you have um, a write allocate scheme, you have to fetch the block into the cache. It doesn't matter if this is write through or write back. You have to fetch the block into the cache for write allocate before you write the word into the cache because otherwise you can end up with words from multiple cache blocks in the same row of the cache. Um, there are mechanisms you can use known as sub blocking to deal with this where you essentially end up with uh, the ability to store tags from multiple blocks in the cache but that's um, a little bit wasteful and also beyond probably the scope of what we want to talk about. Um, I didn't talk about the write no allocate policy for multi-word blocks in that case it kind of works the same you just invalidate the block um, again for a write through cache. Um, Okay, so now let's talk about average memory access time. This is the primary metric to use for studying cache uh, impacts on memory performance. It is not a measure of the CPU performance because we're not tying this into the iron law, but it does impact CPU performance by way of affecting CPI because we just talked about when there are misses, then you have, um, you have to wait for those misses. You stall on some of them, you may stall. And then also the hits, the time to hit can affect the clock cycle time. So that, that can also be an effect on the CPU system performance. We'll talk more about CPU system performance in part three of this series. Um, there's a lot to talk about there. And we may even get, get a chance to work through some examples. We'll see. So the terminology here, the hit time is how long it takes to hit in the cache and get back the data that you want from that level of cache. The miss rate is how often this cache misses. 
it's expressed as a fraction or a percentage. Um, it, it sometimes is written as hit rate. They are uh, additive inverses. So is that right? No, additive complements. Anyway, uh, one minus the miss rate is the hit rate. One minus the hit rate is the miss rate. Okay, so you can substitute them with a one minus. It doesn't really matter. I like this formulation myself. And then the miss penalty is how long it takes to go to the next level of the cache uh, or of the hierarchy. And miss penalty is a recursive formulation of AMAT. And we'll see that in a little bit when we talk about two level cache. We'll look at the formula for two level caches. So first let's take this as a simple example of some numbers I drew from the Pentium 1 processor line, which just had a single level of cache. So the average memory access time is the hit time at the L1 plus the miss rate at the L1 times the miss penalty for the L1 to go to memory and fetch the data. So the L1 access time in this computer is one processor cycle. The memory access time was eight processor cycles. The program behavior is uh, variable depending on what program. So the miss rate is a fact is a function of um, program or workload, right? So how you measure performance depends on what you're measuring in both the hardware sense for the hit time and miss penalty and the software sense for the miss uh, rate. So a 2% miss rate, we can just plug and chug these numbers right in to calculate what the average memory access time is with this cache in terms of processor cycles. It's 1 plus 0 0.02 times 8, which is 1.16. AMAT without a cache would just be 8 cycles for every access, right? Because you go to memory every time that you need to make an access. And so your AMAT with the cache is 8. Uh, without a cache is 8. Um, you would not, you would ignore the hit time of L1, right? Because there's no such thing as an L1. So L1 has a zero hit time and it has a one miss rate. So you could plug it into this formula, zero plus one times eight, which is eight. We could calculate the speed up as well then, right? Right, the speed up of using this cache would then be eight divided by 1.16. Okay. So how do we improve AMAT? Well, we reduce any of these terms. So we reduce the hit time, reduce the miss rate, reduce the miss penalty. Um, and that's one reason I like this formulation rather than using hit rate um, in the formula. So we're going to talk primarily today about reducing the miss rate. This is a factor of program performance, but there are some things that we can do in hardware to try to alleviate this as well. So getting a handle on the sources of misses, <clears throat> there's this taxonomy introduced by, uh, I think it was Mark Hill, quite a, quite a little while ago, called the three C's. Uh, and these three C's are compulsory, capacity, and conflict. There are synonyms for compulsory and conflict, so cold and collision. So you'll sometimes see it as cold capacity or collision or some combination of them. Um, but these are the three C's. So the cold misses are the first misses to a block that's made by a program. You cannot avoid these cold misses um, in per se. We'll see. Capacity is that the cache has a limited amount of data. And once the data that's used by the program exceeds the capacity, then you will get cache misses. And this is inevitable. Um, by the way, I'm, I'm going to mostly be talking about data caches here. Instruction caches have similar issues. They are just a little bit simpler than data caches in general because, um, well, they're different because they only do reads. And then conflict misses are really important, and we're going to spend a lot of time talking about conflict misses because they're the ones we can most easiest try to alleviate in hardware especially. So conflict misses is when you have a block in the cache that gets replaced by another block in the cache. Okay, so that's the cache replacement. And the reason that 
there was a cache replacement is because there was a conflict because the two blocks have the same index. Okay, so conflict misses come about because two blocks have the same index. Now the conflict miss itself is actually when you go back and try to access that first block again. So let's let's call them blocks A and B, right? So you have an access to block A and it goes in the cache, right? Then you have an access to block B and it replaces A in the cache, okay? So now A is no longer in the cache because it got replaced by B. When you try to access A again, you get a cache miss. We call that cache miss a conflict miss because the cache miss is caused by the conflict of A and B, right? So B is in the cache instead of A, and so we get a cache miss. By the way, that first access to A would be a cold miss, right? Because A has never been accessed. So how do we reduce capacity misses? Uh, we increase the cache size, right? If, uh, if the source of the misses is because the cache is too small, then making the cache bigger increases the cache size. So thinking back to our analogy of um, paper on a desk, right, my file system analogy, uh, if you don't remember that, check out the previous um, introduction to cache basics. So making our desk bigger allows us to have more paper at it and therefore we can have fewer misses. Um, by the way, having a bigger cache is going to take me longer to search for anything, right? Having a bigger desk takes me longer, while having a bigger cache takes me longer, which means my hit time goes up, right? It takes me longer to hit in my bigger desk, it takes me longer to hit in a bigger cache in general. Um, we'll talk, a, we may talk a little bit about how hit time and miss penalty factor in here. Those, those are, um, they're, they're heavily influenced by the logic design, actually, and by the electrical circuit uh, design. So compulsory misses, or those cold misses, how can you reduce them? One way is to increase the block size. If you increase the block size, there are fewer blocks in the cache, and therefore you would have fewer compulsory misses. So having more words in each block can reduce the compulsory misses. However, subject to a fixed cache size, having larger blocks means you have fewer blocks in the cache, right? If you have a fixed total, total size, then if you double your block size, you cut in half the number of blocks you can have. So if you have fewer blocks, that means that you have fewer indices, that means you may probably will increase your conflict misses. Another approach that can help with compulsory misses is prefetching. I don't think we're going to talk too much about prefetching. I'm just I'll, I'll give a really quick overview here. The idea is that you issue a cache line fetch for um, for a cache line at the same time as another cache line is being fetched. So the simplest approach is the sequential prefetcher, which instead of just fetching the cache block that is missing, that that ha has the word that causes the miss, you fetch the next cache block in memory as well. So you actually fetch two cache blocks, which increases the um, the the time for the fetch, but that doesn't matter too much when you have critical word first and requested uh, well, requested word first and early restart. But you do increase the number of words being transmitted across the memory, and you might prefetch a block that you don't use, and the prefetched block may cause an eviction of another block, so you could increase your conflict misses. Um, so there's several strategies for prefetching. I don't really want to get into them right now. Uh, maybe some other day I'll put together something about prefetching because um, there are like four or five ways of doing it. <clears throat> so the basic idea is you fetch several blocks, um, more than one block on a miss. You, you can also have software prefetching, by the way, where the software um, says prefetch this line into the cache. That isn't terribly common these days, however. 
Okay, so now let's get back to cache and how cache works. Remember our direct mapped cache. So direct mapped cache, we have an index that tells us exactly which block to look in for our cache. So now we're going to look at a more realistic multi-word direct mapped cache. So multiple words in a block. We're going to stick with a 32-bit word size rather than redraw this every time we want to talk about different word sizes. So 32-bit word sizes. So, oh, this, uh, so this, um, these, um, byte in, these bit indices are a little bit off. I'll see if I can fix these later, maybe. So the first two bits, bit zero and one, are the byte within the word, and so we pretty much ignore those because um, we're going to return all four bytes of the word to the processor, so we don't care about that byte offset. Uh, the next two bits are going to be the offset of the word in the block. So sometimes this will be called the block offset. Occasionally the byte offset will be included in the block offset. It doesn't matter greatly, it's just terminology and, and doing whatever we can to confuse students. So the next field is the index, remember? So if we have a, uh, a cache with 1K of words, right, so 1,024 words, and each word is four bytes, then our cat, each block is four words, I'm sorry, and each word is four bytes, that's fine. So we've got 1,024 words, and we've got four words per block then the number of blocks is 1,024 divided by four. That's two to the 10th divided by two to the second. So that's two to the eighth. So there's 256 indices, 256 blocks, two to the eighth. And so our number of bits in our index is eight because we need eight bits to index from zero to 255. So the eight bit index is used to select one row of the cache and then the tag is compared between the address and the tag that's being stored in the cache. And so the tag is always going to be the most significant bits of the address. We check if they're equal. If they are equal, then it's a hit. While we're doing that, we use the block offset bits, ignoring the byte offset, to, to select the word that we want out of the set of four coming from that row. And we can do this with a multiplexer, right? So um, our multiplexer can pick uh, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, or 1, 1. So we can have um, word 0, word 1, word 2, or word 3, and it'll be picked by the bits of the address accordingly, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. And so then we'll return either the word zero, word one, word two, or word three back to the processor. And the processor will use it if that hit signal is true or one. And it'll ignore it. It'll ignore that data. Otherwise, if it's a miss, it's got to go to the next level of the cache. So that is a direct map cache with multiple words in each block. Uh, at this point now, we're taking advantage of temporal locality when blocks and data are reused, but we can also take advantage here of spatial locality. And that's why this can reduce compulsory misses as well, because we're bringing in cache, we're bringing words into the cache, multiple words into the cache at a time into the same block, and that can reduce the misses when words nearby are accessed in close in time. So let's look at an example here. So we've got, uh, we're going to assume uh, six bit addresses again. This is a continuation of our examples from uh, cache part one, the basics. So here we've got our reference string 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 3, 4, 15. And so assuming we start with an empty cache, but this time we've got um, two words in each block. So we're going to look at a two word per block cache. Then address zero is a miss. And what we bring into the cache at line zero 
is the values of memory at word zero and memory at word one. Okay, so we bring in zero and one because one is next to zero. So now when we access word one, we get a hit. And what we've done is we've removed a cold miss by increasing the block size. Okay, and the tag of address one is uh, zero and its index is now zero because it's sharing the the block offset is what used to be part of its index in the single word direct map cache same case access to two the index of two is one there's nothing in one so that's a miss and we add one with our tag of zeros and the block next to block the the word next to two is three so we've got word three in there which means when we access word three we get a hit now word four is going to be a miss the tag uh sorry that oh that should say six bit addresses four and five it doesn't matter though um, maybe i can fix that later so the index of address four is zero in block zero is tag zero zero but the tag of four is zero one so it's a miss and we replace zero zero with zero one and we've got memory of four and memory of five now three is still in the cache so that's a hit four is still in the cache so that's a hit 15 is not in the cache address 15 which is all ones address 15 is um, index one tag one one well in index one we see the tag is zero zero so that's a miss we replace that block in index one with the block for that contains word 15. So that's a kind of a simple sketch of multi-word blocks. So here we have eight requests, four misses, so a hit rate or miss rate, a miss rate of 50%. So we can look at how miss rate changes as you increase the block size for different um, cache sizes so here we have for an eight kilobyte cache as we increase the block size our miss rate goes down but at a certain point the miss rate starts to increase again and that's because having larger blocks can increase the conflict misses um, and i forget what program this is for um, so 16 kilobyte cache um, again miss rate goes down and then slowly goes back up as as the block size gets larger because of conflicts uh, and then 64 kilobyte cache the miss rate kind of just goes down and then a 256 kilobyte cache um, the the miss rate kind of goes down and plateaus right so there are also kind of in, in addition to increasing conflict misses um, in general there's diminishing returns to to increase in the block size uh, and that's because if the block size becomes a significant fraction of the cache size then we increase capacity uh, eh, that, that doesn't sound right should be conflict misses okay so let's look at another example so this is um, this is something called a ping pong example. So we're just going to look at accesses to two addresses back and forth, zero and four. And in this cache setup, cache zero has uh, index of zero and a tag of zero. Cache four has an index of zero and a tag of one. So zero is a miss, four is a miss, and it replaces zero. So therefore zero is a miss and it replaces four, four is a miss and it replaces zero and so forth. So we can see that this is really a very, a very um, bad cache access uh, sequence for this cache, eight requests, eight misses. And clearly we should be able to do better because we have room in the cache, right? This is not a capacity problem. So this is purely conflicts conflict misses that are causing these memory locations to bounce each other. So we can reduce conflict misses by increasing the cache size, and that's going to change the indices 
when you increase the cache size, you increase the number of indices available because you have more places to put blocks. So that's going to change the layout. And so that can reduce the conflict misses. It can also increase the conflict misses for a given program, right? Because all of a sudden, blocks that didn't used to align on the same index now do. Um, that, that can happen, uh, although it's, it's a little unusual. More commonly, and what we really want to talk about today, is that you increase associativity, and this is a really common thing. So associativity, um, well, let's explain it first by analogy. So if our direct map cache is we have one place to put every piece of paper, then a set associative cache means we have sets where we can put multiple pieces of paper. So a set associative cache allows us to put blocks into a set um, in, in the mathematical sense of an unordered set without duplicates. We'll see what that means in a moment. So memory is a linear array of two to the n bytes. Um, and we store blocks in the cache as cache lines of size 2 to the m. So the, the block size is 2 to the m. And cache is an, is an array of 2 to the k bytes. Or you can think of it as an array of blocks as well. And the address encoding, we know how to calculate the tag, the index, and the offset. The direct mapped approach, we um, rotate through the indices of the block using modulo arithmetic. So block 11 goes into the um, block address 11 modulo the number of blocks in the cache, which is 8. So it always goes into line 3, and there's no choice about it. In a set associative cache, we're going to divide up the cache into sets. So here we have a two-way set associative cache. There's two... Um, there's two possible places for each block in each set. So we've got set 0, set 1, set 2, and set 3. And block 11 can go anywhere in set 3. We take the block address modulo the number of sets. So the, the number of sets is going to be the total number of blocks divided by the number of ways. And we'll talk about, we'll show a picture of what that means because I know the terminology can be a little confusing. Finally, fully associative caches <clears throat> is a set associative cache where all of the blocks are in the same set. So block 11 can go anywhere. Okay, so these are the three policies to place blocks in a cache, and let's look at associative caches in a little bit. So let's look at how uh, the caches, how these three different policies divide up the memory address. So a fully associative cache doesn't have an index because the cache block can go anywhere, so we look everywhere. So all we need is our block offset and our tag, and we try to match the tag with anything in the cache. We already know our direct map cache, where the index is equal to the log of the number of blocks. Uh, set associative cache, the index is equal to the logarithm base 2 of the number of sets. Um, and you can really generalize this to say the index is equal to the log of the number of sets, where you say that the direct mapped cache has the number of sets equal to the number of blocks. So um, there, there's only one way in each set. And fully associative has one set, and log of one is zero, so there's zero bits in the index. Okay, so the set associative cache, here's an example with the six-bit memory addresses with one-word blocks, and uh, we ignore the, the offset of a byte within a block because the, ca the processor wants a full word back. So the two lowest order bits, least significant two bits, are ignored. In a set associative cache with um, four blocks in it and two ways, has 
two sets, set 0 and set 1. So there's only one bit for the index. So we use the next least significant bit to determine which set in the cache to put our data. So that's flip-flopping between 0 and 1. And then we're going to match our try to match our tags with anything in that set. We compare all of the cache tags in the set to the most significant bits of the address being accessed to determine if the memory block is in the cache. Uh, the reason this works is that we can do this search in parallel in hardware. So we can uh, associatively search all of the ways of the set to match their tags in parallel. And that's where the word associative comes from here. So first let's look at a, an example before we look at the next level of detail of how this kind of looks like in an implementation without diving all the way down to the circuit level, but at that sort of higher level diagram PowerPoint lecture level. So here's our ping pong example again, bouncing back between zero and four, this time with a two-way set associative cache. So we've got the two ways in each set, and because there's only four blocks, that means there's only two sets. Number of blocks divided by the number of ways is the number of sets. So we've got our addresses for zero and four here, and our indices, and again, they're in the same index, right? The, the, they still have an index of zero, but now, when four misses in set zero, we can put it in the other way that's unoccupied. And so now both of those blocks are in set zero and they both can hit, right? And they could keep hitting. And so we would have eight requests with just the two cold misses at the start. So uh, a miss rate of just 25% uh, instead of 100%. So this is the advantage of associative caches. Let us look at the um, a diagram of the implementation. So here we have a four-way set associative cache. We're going to assume one-word block sizes. Um, the generalization to multi-word block sizes is identical to the direct mapped cache. You just use the um, you just have a, a larger offset for determining which of the words in the block you want to return to the processor. So we've got way 0, way 1, way 2, and way 3. And we take the index bits. Um, sorry, I forgot to, to finish the calculation of the index. Right? If we have um, 256 sets, then we need log base 2 of 256 or log base 2 of 2 to the 8th, so 8 bits to index the cache. So we, we take whatever number is in that 8 bits of the index and we use that to select that line in each in every way. And what we do is we drop down the data, uh, the tag and the valid bit from every way, and we check them all in parallel in circuit in hardware circuits, right? So the tag from the address goes into those comparators and it should really be drawn as um, happening sort of in parallel. This is not a sequential process, okay? So the address tag goes to every one of those comparators, those equality comparators simultaneously. And then the valid bit is going into that AND gate and the comparison check is coming out of those tags and so you get your hit signal for all four of the ways simultaneously. And we need the hit signal to do two things. Our hit signal is going to be ORed to determine overall if we had a hit. And we're also going to use our hit signal to select which of the ways has the data that we want. So we, um, we send our hit signal, which is a, a one those, only one of those AND gates can be a one. Um, we ensure that by making sure that we only ever put, that, that we have no duplicate tags in the cache. 
um, that would be bad. So the the ands are a one. They're they're basically a one hot encoded um, four line input to that selector, which um, which is basically a an encoder and a multiplexer. So um, it it doesn't matter the what the circuit actually is. So the the four by one selector will take the four data inputs and select one of them as the output. It, it works basically like a multiplexer um, with a one hot encoded input rather than an integer in, encoded input. So I think that that covers it for four ways that associative. Um, so the the associativity each time you double associativity um, you double the number of blocks in each set and therefore you have the number of sets and so your index bit changes by one bit for each um, each doubling of associativity um, you you shrink the index by one or if you have your associativity you increase it by one your block offset selects the word in the block. Sometimes this is combined with the byte offset. Sometimes the byte offset is ignored. Index selects the set and the tag is used for comparison. So as you increase associativity, you shrink the index. And if you increase it all the way to fully associative, then you have no index. That's what that says there. Same thing if you decrease associativity all the way to direct mapped, in which case your index is as large as it can be. Um, yeah, only one way in each set. That is the same kind of idea as direct mapped. So as you have uh, increasing cache sizes going down this plot and increasing associativity, you can see that uh, increasing associativity does benefit, but there are diminishing returns, especially at larger cache sizes, where the larger capacity of the cache um, does probably more to offset the, the conflict misses than the associativity. And you get the most benefit from going from one-way to two-way associative caches. And um, I, I think this is probably over some benchmark set. I don't remember. Uh, this came out of Hennessy and Patterson's book. So um, because of this, it's pretty common to only see two-way associative caches or fully associative caches. And that's because of the cost of implementation, which we'll talk about as well. Um, so two-way is very common fully associative is somewhat common. You do see four-way and eight-way sometimes, um, especially in the, the translation look-aside buffer for caching virtual address translations, which we'll talk about in the future. Uh, so then one, one more important factor for associative caches is cache replacement. So when we replace a block, which way do we replace? Right, so if if we have a cache miss and all the ways in a, in the set have um, have valid data in them, we have to pick one of them to evict, right? Because we want to make room for our new data that we're fetching. So the simplest policy and the the one that's sort of time honored is LRU, least recently used. So we pick the block that has been unused for the longest time. So which block in the cache is the least recently used block is the one that we get rid of. And we need to have hardware in order to keep track of the relative usage of each block with respect to each other. In a four way, in, I'm sorry, in a two way set associative cache, it just takes one bit for each set. That bit tells you which way was referenced um, most recently. So each time you reference a, a, a way, a block, you set the LRU bit to that way number, right? So if you get a hit, when you get a hit, 
and the hit is way zero, then you set your LRU bit to zero. If you get a hit and the way is one, you set the LRU bit to one. Um, and that's that's the way you uh, know which way was used most recently. So then when you go to evict, you evict the other way. Okay. Um, so it also costs quite a bit of hardware to do to implement set associative caches. So you need those equality comparators, which is going to increase the time it takes to do tag matches and the space it takes to do those matches. You need that multiplexer to select which ways data to use. Um, which is also going to increase the logic delay of the cache and the size of the cache slightly. Um, and then the, the data is available after you do the set selection. So you have to wait until you do your tag comparison and your hit check and your mucks before you can return the data that you want to the processor. In the direct map cache, you can actually return that data immediately in parallel to figuring out the hit and sending that hit signal to the processor. And then the processor can decide whether or not it wants to use that data which was returned to it. Um, so this means that the direct map cache can be faster because it can return the data and, and get that data starting to flow before the hit check. So associative caches are slower they're more expensive, they take up more space, and so you tend not to see associative caches in the L1 cache um, because of this impact on hit, hit time. Uh, it, so in addition to reducing conflict misses, when you have associative caches, you can improve the replacement policy to also reduce conflict misses because the replacement policies are going to affect the miss rate. So here are several of the common policies. We already talked about LRU. Um, LRU is really expensive to implement when it's larger than uh, two-way associative cache. Um, I, I might put together a short little demonstration of why that is. FIFO, first in, first out, that is also gets in, gets more expensive to implement. Um, it's not, it, it's useful if you know that your data are streaming through the cache rather than um, having some kind of usage. Pseudo LRU is a um, is an approximation of the least recently used approach and that can be used in higher associative caches. So uh, four-way pseudo LRU may be um, effective enough and there's other approaches. NMRU not the most recently used um, which in a two-way cache is identical to LRU, but in uh, larger ways, the not most recently used simply keeps track of the most recently used and then picks one of the other ones to, to, to not be, um, to be replaced or can pick. Uh, random, which actually works pretty well. It's actually pseudo-random. Um, chooses, chooses a way to replace at random from the set. There are machine learning approaches for implementing cache replacement using some machine learning and hardware. And then there's this uh, re-reference interval prediction, which, was, uh, which is a relatively newer um, described approach and is called RRIP. And I, I provide, um, there's, a, there's a paper about it from, I think it was ISCA 2000 and I don't remember what year it was in. Um, anyway, so the idea of the replacement policy is to choose the victim row to evict from the set, the victim way um, to evict from the set. And um, these are several of the policies. There are the basic, there are kind of these, I think there was, were enumerated by Hennessy and Patterson in their book on quantitative computer architecture. Um, a, a great book. Um, 
So we talked about already that you can increase the block size, increase the cache size, increase associativity. And these will reduce misses of these kinds of types, but they can also increase other factors of AMAT. So increasing the block size can reduce compulsory misses, but it can increase the other conflict misses, um, even capacity misses, because you may be fetching unused words into the cache. So you'll be, you'll be exhausting the cache capacity quicker. And it can increase the miss penalty, will increase the miss penalty in general, because you're fetching more words into the cache. So it's going to take longer to fill up a cache row. Uh, having an increased cache size can reduce the capacity and conflict misses, but it increases the hit time, it increases the power and the cost of the, pro of the cache, um, and so forth. Uh, multiple cache levels can reduce the miss penalty, and it allows you to optimize at each level of the cache. We're going to look at that next. Two other basic optimizations are to prioritize read misses over writes because the read misses definitely stall the processor. You want to get those done sooner. So if you have a, a read miss and a write miss uh, going out at the same time or even a write going at the same time, you may prioritize or allow the read miss to go out to the next level of cache before completing the write to the next level of cache. Um, and then avoid address translation of the cache index. That's a little trick we'll talk about when we talk about um, virtual memory. This is something that I like to refer to as a virtually indexed, physically tagged cache. Um, probably that's a common thing. So looking at an example of a two-level cache, these, uh, these access times were pulled from a um, uh, circa Pentium 4 processor. So we can reformulate that miss penalty of the L1 as a recursive formulation of AMAT as the hit time at L2 plus the miss rate at L2 times the miss penalty at L2. So this gives us AMAT for a two level cache. So the L1 has a two cycle hit time. L2 has a 19 cycle hit time. And then the memory access is 240 cycles. Then we can crank out the AMAT, assuming we were given the program behavior, which is 5% miss rate at L1 and 25% miss rate at L2. We just plug and chug, right? We've got our L2, our L1 hit time of two, added to our L1 miss rate of 5%, multiplied by the next level, which is the hit time of L2, 19, plus the miss rate of L2, which is 25%. Uh, multiplied by the missed penalty of L2, which is the time it takes to go out to memory, so 240. So we can add those up and we get an average memory access time of 5.95. So this is how you calculate AMAT for uh, multiple levels of cache. Um, some advanced cache optimizations. So implement using a small and simple L1 cache keeps the L1 cache hit time low, which is what you want. Um, so that you don't have to uh, disturb the processor cycle time. Way prediction is um, predicting which way is going to be accessed so that you don't have to wait for the multiplexer. Pipelined and bank caches, non-blocking caches, we'll talk about on the next slide. We already talked about critical word first and early restart. Merging write buffers is where you can allow multiple stores that miss to merge into the same store buffer if they're um, if they're writing to the same or nearby cache rows uh, or blocks rather. And then there's some um, compilers approaches that can be used to help improve cache accesses. So changing the order in which loops execute, especially long, large loops over huge arrays that are larger than the cache, and then blocking of arrays into cache-sized chunks and arranging the order in which you access those blocks so that you maximize their time spent in the cache. These optimizations matter a lot, especially in scientific programming and then prefetching both at hardware and software levels. So pipeline caches, it allows the, the cache to pipeline its accesses. So you, you separate out the cache indexing logic from the hit detection and muxing, 
and the word transfer back to the processor so that you can um, you can have associative caches then and more associative caches and what you do is you just spread the um, if this is the L1 cache you spread the L1 cache accesses over multiple processor pipeline stages now so maybe you have a, a three stage L1 instruction cache fetch where the first stage does the indexing and begins the cache access the second stage does the hit detection and the third stage does the word selection or the returning the the instruction to the processor right um, of course increasing the number of stages of the pipeline can increase the penalty for branch misprediction especially if this is the instruction cache being pipelined non-blocking caches allow you to continue to make cache accesses while the cache is dealing with a miss so there's two basic approaches one allows you to continue to hit while there's a miss being dealt with the other allows you to have another miss happen um, under a miss it's more expensive because you need to have multiple miss hardware available to deal with multiple misses at the same time and then uh, multi-banked caches uh, allow you to have multiple accesses to the cache simultaneously and um, we, we may talk about banking and interleaving when we talk about how memory works uh, in part three. So uh, this was a pretty, pretty exhaustive look at AMAT, average memory access time, and at how to reduce the miss rate. Miss rate's not the only factor, right? You have to consider the hit time and the miss penalty. Hit time is especially important for the L1 cache because if the hit time is too large, then it may affect the clock's processor um, clock cycle. And the three C's of cache misses give us a handle on understanding the effect of cache misses. Um, when we talk about multi-processor cache, we'll introduce the fourth C, which is coherency misses. misses. We'll save that for another time. So next time, we'll talk about the impact of cache overall on computer system performance. Uh, have a good one.